Okay, so uh, to get back to AFM diagrams, just to recap a little bit here, um, we've already talked about the, the petrogenetic grid, which is um, this series of reactions up here, and the AFM diagram, where the AFM diagram changes as a rock undergoes some systematic change in pressure and temperature. So here at fixed composite, or fixed, <laughs> composite, fixed pressure of eight kilobars and increasing temperature, um, we can see the, uh, the changes in assemblages. Let's see if that, yeah, there we go. And so garnet comes in, storolite comes in, crossing tie line reaction, uh, another crossing, or the uh, terminal reaction, another crossing tie line reaction, another crossing tie line reaction, and then we lose uh, chlorite. And uh, oh, we and we're going to lose storolite um, as an interior phase. Yep, there it goes. And so then we're just left with kyanite, garnet, and biotite as the three phase assemblage. Of course, if you have compositions over here, garnet, kyanite here, garnet, biotite here, kyanite, biotite. Okay. And a different pressure would give you a different series of, of assemblages. One of the reasons that we care about AFM diagrams is that it gives you a sense of where you are in pressure temperature space, especially with respect to uh, temperature. So for example, in this rock where biotite, garnet, and chlorite are all stable, um, that assemblage is stable only in these three diagrams, H, I, and J, and in PT space, H is this little sliver here, I is this little sliver here, and J is this little sliver here. So the assemblage garnet by type chlorite should be stable only within this sort of banana-shaped region here. And then, of course, we also talked about the metamorphic facies, where the mineralogy of mafic rocks also says something about pressure and temperature. If you have a green schist facies assemblage versus an amphibolite facies assemblage, these are all the different assemblages. We don't need to uh, go through them, except to say that amphibolite is characterized by specific minerals that are different than, say, the blue schist facies and, and so on. So if this is our, our area with the, of, um, the metapelite, for example, that we were just talking about garnet biotite chlorite, you would predict that a mafic rock in this area would be in the epidote amphibolite facies. And so it would have some assemblage characteristic of the epidote amphibolite facies, and that's this transitional state here. So plagioclase of some variety could be albitic, could be ha have a little more sodium or more calcium in it. Uh, epidote. An amphibole, likely actinolite, you might start picking up hornblende, uh, probably chlorite, and then depending on the exact bulk composition, you could, you could have one of these other phases here. Okay, and so it would, you would definitely have epidote, clinozoocyte, and I would say hornblende or actinolite, and plagioclase, but it could be very albitic. So here's where I wanted to, to go next, which is, so what do you do if there are too many AFM minerals? Like how do you interpret a system like this? Now remember that in the KF MASH system, six system components, if I fix pressure and temperature, the most number of phases that I can have at equilibrium is six. Um, and we already picked three of them. It's uh, quartz, water, and muscovite, or K-Feldspar if it's at high temperature. But there's always those three to even begin to do an AFM uh, uh, diagram. And so you should only have three what we, what we call AFM phases. And the problem is that you find rocks like this one where there are four. So garnet is an AFM phase. Spinel, we haven't talked about where that plots, but that's also an AFM phase. Um, Sillimanite over here and, and biotite down here. So how can you have four AFM phases? Well, one possibility is that it, there's a reaction. Okay, so if you have four phases, they, they could be related by a reaction that has just been frozen in. And so this, there is a reaction that goes on here biotite plus sillimanite 
goes to K Feldspar, there is K Feldspar present, plus spinel. And so these, um, these three minerals here, biotite, spinel, and um, sillimanite, are not in equilibrium with each other. That's possible. Um, if they're not in equilibrium, then they could coexist. It's because the AFM question is, how, can you how could you have four phases at equilibrium? Well, one of the answers is they're not at equilibrium. It's also possible that this is not a KF mash chemical system. It certainly does have K, F, E, M, G, A, L, S, I, and hydrogen in it, but there can be other components that are in there as well. Garnets have manganese, garnets have calcium. So maybe these other phases are the AFM phases that strictly fall within the KF mash system, but this is a third component, it could, calcium or manganese or, or a combination of both. Um, it's also possible, it turns out, that spinels um, can take up zinc, and so that, that can pull them off of the AFM plane, and then you could have co four or even more uh, coexisting phases. Sometimes you see that with storolite. Storolite likes to take up a bunch of zinc, and so uh, you can find little bits of storolite in some rocks, and it's not because uh, storolite would normally be stable, it's because there's a bunch of zinc in the rock, and so that's stabilizing the storolite. Now, one of these minerals could just be retrograde. That's a, that's a bit like a, a frozen-in reaction, except usually it's uh, taken to mean that there's been some infiltrate, usually infiltration of water that has caused back reaction of some minerals, but not others. And so really common is to see chlorite growing around the edges of garnet. And we would say, well, the garnet has reacted with some water that came into the rock late in the game and created this chloride, that doesn't mean that the garnet and the biotite, for example, would be out of equilibrium and maybe they coexist with sillimanite or whatever, um, but this extra chloride that might be sitting along the, the rim or biotite potentially in, in this rock could be just some really late stage uh, phenomenon. And so the other phases might be in equilibrium, but biotite in this one or chloride at low grade are, are not in equilibrium. And there's all kinds of other possibilities. There's um, one thing that people talk about is, um, is, there, is there a fluid phase present? Well, what if it's all dry? Well, then you can stabilize one phase, like biotite, because it has hydrogen in it, because you don't have that other phase, the fluid phase present. That's not generally what people think, but it, it is a possibility. Uh, let's see what else could happen. There's a phenomenon, it's called the Ostwald step rule, and what it says is that if you take an assemblage that's at high Gibbs free energy and it's trying to get to a different assemblage at low Gibbs free energy, it goes through a series of steps at intermediate Gibbs free energies. And what that means is that if you have one assemblage that's ultimately trying to turn into the lowest Gibbs free energy assemblage, it can go through intermediate assemblages to get there. <laughs> so you could, you could have really complicated uh, associations of minerals because of this, of this step rule. You don't go from A to B, you go from like A to C to B. That's a possibility. Another possibility that people talk about is how well are these rocks, or how well are these minerals communicating with each other? And um, you might say, well, okay, you've said there is a bulk composition. Well, what if the minerals in the rock are not all communicating with each other, right? You could have one local bulk composition, which is characterized by uh, biotite and quartz and plagioclase and, and uh, maybe some garnet over here and some oxide here. And this is the, that part of the rock is actually not communicating with this part of the rock. And so this part of the rock actually has a different bulk composition characterized more by a lot of sillimanite, a little bit of biotite, some spinel, quartz, and, and, and so on. That's really hard to track down. Normally, as rocks are heating up and there's a fluid present, we think that the minerals do communicate, um, but it is an open question. It's something that's being discussed right now a lot, um, is how exactly do we express the bulk composition, and is it possible to get sub-assemblages in different parts of a rock because you have uh, different 
local bulk compositions. And local, on you know, people talk about scales of like millimeters or centimeters. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you how I normally think about metapelites. There's the, there's the whole petrogenetic grid, and it's really useful to look at the, uh, the AFM assemblage. But most of the time, what I think about are the typical temperatures at which different minerals form. And this is for typical metapolitic rocks. So these turn out to have low bulk aluminum compositions. And what that means is that when they get up to about 500 degrees here, then they stabilize garnet, chlorite, and biotite. And that's, that's that triangle that sits towards the bottom half of the AFM diagram. They're high aluminum assemblages. Those have all kinds of other really interesting minerals. You can have storolite that forms at like 450 degrees, but you don't see that in typical bulk compositions. That's something that norm that would only occur in a high aluminum bulk composition. Every one of these reactions correspond, or every one of these mineral in isograds corresponds with the reaction. So as we start out in the green chist bases and increased temperature, we cross the biotite in reaction, and that means there's a reaction that literally produces biotite at the expense of lower grade minerals. And then similarly, when we get to the garnet isograd, there's a reaction that creates garnet at the expense of lower grade minerals, and so on and so on and so on. And so here's the garnet in isograd. This is the main reaction. Um, you start out with chlorite, biotite, uh, muscovite is in here, and sometimes you'll actually have a little bit of carbonate in here as well. Um, and that reacts to form uh, garnet. It's Essentially, it's chlorate plus quartz goes to garnet plus water. But what you end up with is a rock that has garnet um, and uh, biotite is the other, the other key phase here, garnet plus biotite. And in this case, I think there's a little bit of chlorite floating around the, the section somewhere. This reaction is, um, the storolite in reaction, is where garnet plus chlorite tie line breaks down to form the storolite, uh, which is this host phase out here, plus biotite uh, uh, stable tie line. That's, that's one of the crossing tie line reactions that, that we, we see. It's an important one for how storolite first comes in. The kyanite in reaction, that's another crossing tie line reaction. That's storolite plus biotite reacts to form, wait, is that right? Storolite plus chlorite reacts to form biotite plus kyanite. That's the reaction, another crossing tie line reaction. So here's a rock, here's our storolite, garnet biotite. There may be a little chlorite sitting in some part of the rock. That reacts and you can form kyanite here. Uh, at the expense of storolite. You form kyanite plus biotite together. At the sillimanite isograd, it's basically the reaction kyanite goes to sillimanite. And so here's a kyanite grain. There's no sillimanite in this rock, trust me. Here's a kyanite grain, high relief, but it's all embayed, blobby, surrounded by muscovite because there's a weird kind of chemical interactions that go on. But sillimanite is forming uh, in the matrix here. K-feldspar in, that's where muscovite breaks down to form K-feldspar plus sillimanite. Sometimes at low pressures, it's a dehydration reaction, but in a lot of higher pressure reactions like 6, 7, 8 kilobars and above, um, it's a dehydration melting reaction. So in fact, what happens is muscovite plus plagioclase plus quartz react to form a melt. So some of this was probably melt before it crystallized plus K feldspar. So there really is K feldspar in the rock as well. Um, and then you also, it also produces a bunch of uh, sillimanite. And then the last one is, um, and I have never seen this in my own rocks. I don't have the right the bulk compositions and temperatures, um, but there is an orthopyroxene in isograd where the biotite here, iron, magnesium, uh, potassium biotite, breaks down to form K feldspar and um, orthopyroxene. This is orthopyroxene over here. And you can tell that this was originally a metapelite because it's, it has sillimanite in it. It's a very high aluminum composition. It's not like it's a uh, you know, metamorphic rock or anything like that. And so here are those diagrams that show how those reactions occur. So chlorate plus quartz goes to garnet plus water. That's basically this triangle sweeps across the bulk composition. Here's the crossing tie line reaction. 
for uh, garnet chlorate here stabilizes to storolite plus biotite, and so you find storolite in a rock. There's this reaction here, storolite chlorite goes to kyanite plus biotite. That brings kyanite into the rocks. Um, storolite can disappear from the system. Kyanite goes to sillimanite, and then um, what else? When we talked about muscovite goes to uh, K-feldspar. Remember, what that does is it shifts the plotting position of the biotite from below the FM join up to the FM join. So this is now Fe and Mg over here. And orthopericine doesn't show up on here because we didn't carry the AFM diagrams to that high temperature. Okay, so at this point, I would hope that you can look at an AFM diagram, and especially if you've got, you know, a labeled key, right, this is where garnet is, this is where chloride is, um, that you'd be able to look at the distribution of triangles and say, here is what I would predict for the stable assemblage if I were in this triangle. Um, then you could also identify incompatible AFM assemblages, so minerals that could not coexist uh, based on the distribution of triangles. So if garnet and chloride is stable, storolite and biotite are not. So you would not expect to see storolite and biotite together in a rock that coexists with rocks that have garnet plus chloride stable. Um, we talked a little bit about petrogenetic grids, so if you have the petrogenetic grid labeled with the different regions, B, C, D, E, F, whatever, and the AFM diagrams, then you could say, okay, here's where this triangle, or whatever, two mineral assemblages, this is where they would be stable on this diagram. And then if I have an overlapping uh, politic assemblage um, diagram, like the, the petrogenetic grid with the AFM diagrams, and with uh, the facies on there, that you could, you could make this comparison between the AFM assemblage that you observe and the uh, metamorphic grade, the facies that you would identify from metabasites.